How does one turn their engineering expertise into a viable business opportunity? How do you know if you're cut out to be an entrepreneur like this? And how do you go about figuring out client problems? My guest today is the founder and CEO of High Tech Advisors, a business and technology consulting company which provides solutions to some of the biggest household names. This is the Discovery Arc podcast. I am Drew Duglin, and today we welcome Haresh Sangani. So Haresh, you run a, I guess, what would you call it? A business technology consulting company. So what does that mean? What is it that you sort of actually do? Yes, uh, Drew, thanks for having me. Um, I run a team, we're called High Tech Advisors. And uh, we got our start through empathy. I, uh, when I was in the shoes of what our, our clients now in, the, in past lives, uh, you know, we were looking for technology and business experts uh, teams who would provide different types of services to solve engineering and business problems. So on the product side, it could be everything having to do with the product lifecycle from product strategy uh, product management to building products, deploying them, operating them, and then retiring them. And then um, also on the IT front, uh, which is leveraging products or technology as opposed to building and selling them to other people. So we're a business and technology consulting firm uh, based in Seattle. Uh, we have some of the kind of the local logos uh, as well as some of the outside of town logos, but you know we have uh, Microsoft, Costco, Nintendo, the Gates Foundation, a bunch of startups and uh, some mid-sized companies as well. But I've been in Seattle for a long time. I've been in technology for a long time. And um, whenever I was in the client's shoes, we wanted people that were providing high quality service and that were easy to do business with. And so now through kind of the empathy and the experience of, you know, sometimes not finding those people easily, we are uh, delivering on that and at least trying to deliver on that for our clients, which is, you know, quality, um, quality service and easy to do business with. You mentioned the empathy there, and that seems to be a core thesis of your sort of own, uh, I guess, perspective in the way you operate. Why is that the case? How did that come to be such a central player and feature? Absolutely. I mean, empathy obviously is a very uh, human and universal aspect, right, of of the universe. And uh, all of us have it. I guess some of us don't. And then the psychologists call us uh, not normal uh, when we don't have empathy uh, with our fellow human beings. But I think uh, for me personally, um, and we've talked about it a little bit in the past as well, uh, the two things that are really, really critical uh, in having fun in life as well as achieving um, goals is empathy and curiosity. Um, and I think it's very natural for us when we travel through a journey to say, oh, you know, I mean, this was my experience. I wish, you know, these two things didn't happen and these five things had happened sooner or something like that. And, and that would have saved me aches and pain, etc. And so... I think it's very natural for us humans and for, I feel that personally to empathize with people and uh, that becomes oftentimes a driving factor. I mean, you've heard the stories of people, people becoming doctors because their family had a health event, right? Or people being inspired to be a carpenter because they saw somebody working as a carpenter when you know they were a child or whatever it may be. Um, I think uh, some, uh, for me personally, it's hard to explain the why of empathy, but I know what it is, and I find it, uh, it makes you feel good, right? Or it makes me feel good when I'm able to empathize with people. So uh, for me, I'm, I'm super curious about what other humans' journeys have been and what they've gone through. And also, I'm, as I get older, I used to be very shy as a child, but I'm very open now to share about my experiences as compared to I was when I was younger, so that maybe other people can, um, you know, see similarities between my journey and their journeys, whether they are their past journeys or their future journeys. Eventually, the idea is to, um, one of the ideas, one of the goals I have is to inspire people, uh, for the young people that might be listening, uh, who are might be, who might be starting on their career journeys, 
um, and and I've found for me personally, curiosity is a big inspiring agent. So when I get curious about something, I go do it. And then uh, that overlays nicely with empathy because I'm curious about other human beings and their journeys as well. And so in, in, in go, going back to our work, uh, I worked in engineering teams, operations teams, product teams, et cetera, in my 20s and 30s. And uh, eventually I got a chance to work with clients. And so that was uh, kind of a light bulb movement for me, even though I had trained initially, I wanted to be a physicist and then I turned into an engineer. And then I did that for a while and, and it was fun actually while I was doing it. Uh, but then I discovered later when I started working with clients that that was like a whole different world because no matter what institute you're in, what organization you're in, I find that the world outside of your four walls is always more intriguing, more curious, more inviting, or at least more exciting sometimes, oftentimes, than whatever your four walls are. That doesn't mean that it doesn't matter what happens inside of your four walls. That matters greatly because it's kind of like taking care of your health, right? You have one body and that's, a, that's the inside of your four walls. That has to be taken care of. Um, and so once I started working with the clients, then uh, the, the breadth was tremendous because you could live 10 lives at once. Right, each you're living through clients' lives kind of vicariously. So if you have ten clients or ten thousand clients, right, for example, but individually most people don't have ten thousand clients, or just not in a way that they can personally empathize with any one of them individually. Um, but however many clients you have in whatever domains that you have, you will be able to, um, you know, have exposure to a lot of breadth, right, and then. If you are a person driven by empathy, you'll have an opportunity to, in a way, empathize with a lot more people than you would uh, just, you know, staying inside of your four walls, working with the internal teams, etc. Of course, when you work in large companies, internal teams can be huge, right? In even hundreds of thousands of people. Um, but when you internal to teams or companies, there are a lot more restrictions or a lot more, there's a lot more structure. <laughs> And I found as an entrepreneur um, that I I was the one able to create the structure or the limits or the lack of limits and whatever whatever I did. In our team, we have some senior people who've been around for you know 20, 30 years or even longer in the workforce. And they kind of share my my uh, value system or our value system of being extremely customer centric, being driven through empathy and, and uh, through breadth. Um, and we call ourselves experts. I think using experts on behalf of the clients. So a lot of the team members that we have are deep experts in different domains, whether it's uh, cybersecurity or, you know, engineering products or um, uh, cloud, you know, computing or cloud operations and so on, which are one set of the clients that we have. So, um, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a set of factors, I suppose. Yeah. Right. And going back to your personal journey, because I am I'm very intrigued. You mentioned you were shy there as a child. Why do you think that was? Um, I guess it, it I mean, <laughs> if you talk to evolutionary psychologists or evolutionary biologists as to why do humans have personalities, right? And you might know a lot more about this than I do. Then there's there's probably some explanation that says it makes you better Darwinian in a Darwinian sense as a species for us to have different personalities. And then we have our friends in uh, genetics telling us there is, you know, drift and inheritance and uh, uh, mutation that gives you all these things. And so I ended up with a personality that had shyness in it. I don't have a, a rational explanation as to right what what uh, it was very emotional and and I'm sure people who are extroverts have the same thing. Um, there's you don't get to have an explanation or at least you don't focus on the explanation. You're just like this is what you are, whether it's your height or your shyness or whatever. And um, part of it maybe sometimes shyness might go with um, um, above average uh, aptitude. And early, so like I, I might have had above average aptitude when I was younger, you know, cognitive aptitude or whatever. And then that might make you more analytical. And so you're like absorbing things 
and observing things before you open your mouth. And then you want to open your mouth only when you're sure, <laughs> right? And in life, that's hard because most of the times you're not sure, <laughs> right? You, you, you can't be sure because if you're really analytical, it's like, do I have enough data? Do I have enough data? Do I have enough data? And you're in the data business, so you know, uh, you never have enough data. And, and, and uh, so, the, it, but it, it was kind of, and a lot of shy people um, probably have had this journey. So like going through high school, I was an immigrant in the US uh, when I started high school, uh, being shy, learning the language, learning the culture and all that. It wasn't probably a, um, a fun experience uh, all the time, um, making friends or, you know, trying to make social connections and so on. But the good thing, I, I suppose, especially now with the, the younger folks, there's so much you could do uh, even, even by being kind of an introvert, right? Steve Wozniak, I think is, I don't know how to say his last name, the co-founder of Apple, right? He, he, he actually touts introvertism or, or not exactly shyness, but he's like, he, he says that, that in, you know, great to accomplish many great things, you need intense focus and concentration. And sometimes people who are able to who are naturally shy or not able to, you know, <laughs> get distracted or by other humans or other activities, they're able to kind of do that more naturally. And then they're able to solve a set of problems, help solve a set of problems that sometimes the extra, extroverts don't have the same set of tools to do. And, um, uh, but eventually, you know, you build confidence. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, you came through the academic journey of uh, getting a PhD and, you know, understanding or studying science and so on. One of the things that when I was in graduate school and since that I've thought about and that I've learned is that, and, and maybe this is a big debate of artificial intelligence, um, so far, at least until, you know, uh, generative AI has come along, the best way to learn was from another human. And the best way for a human to teach was to probably teach other humans, right? Or, or through some sort of a, less scalable interaction, right? And in the sciences and in, in the, in, especially in the PhD programs, we know that really well, right? You're stuck in this four walls, <laughs> these four walls for a number of years. And that's kind of, for a lot of us, it's the first time we get to work intensely for a significant period of time on kind of sometimes narrow problems. And then, so, and then all the humanness that goes with it, right? You'll, you'll get to your know, professor's personality or your colleagues' personalities and who works well and who has what strengths and you're kind of sorting it all out. And in graduate school, there's not a lot of structure, right? It's not like somebody tells you these are the rules other than here's your, you know, research grant or whatever. But otherwise, there's, there's very few rules. And so I think, uh, you know, learning, learning from other humans or teaching other humans is, is critical. And then, so for me, over time, um, I got to learn from a lot, of, a lot of other people and I got to have opportunities to teach other people. And that might have also helped uh, reduce the apprehension or reservation I would have had about talking. So. so it feels like that analytical mindset sort of pushed you maybe towards physics then. Did you watch Oppenheimer? Actually, I'm interested. Did you watch the movie? I did. Um, what did you think of it? I actually, so, so, um, I, I, I guess, um, it, it's a huge subject, right? Uh, there's another documentary, I think in Netflix called, uh, turning point, the bomb in the cold war or something like that, right? Which overlaps in time and events with a lot of things that were in Oppenheimer. Um, and, and this subject has been written and exposed and analyzed, you know, uh, uh, heavily, right, to say the least. And so um, I think, I, I guess I can think about the question in different ways. So first time I actually studied this, I was in, a teenager. There was a book by Richard Rhodes called The Making of the Atomic Bomb. And then he wrote another book called The Making of the Hydrogen Bomb. And uh, I, I actually read the first one when I was a physics student 
as an undergraduate uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And so it's a huge subject. And I think there are a lot of people that kind of had an influence or on the ultimate outcomes or all the ultimate events, right, of making and then the using of the atomic weapons and so on. And so I think Oppenheimer, uh, the movie I thought was done really well, and um, it reflected actually the events fairly well. A lot of times historical fiction can be very far from history, right? In this case, I thought it was pretty close to what had happened. Of course, they had to dramatize it a little bit. And, um, and he was a human being, right? Oppenheimer was a human being with all the flaws and strengths and so on. And then he was caught in the circumstances of the times, including, you know, McCarthyism and, and so on. But I, I thought it was a fantastic movie. They did a good job. Um, the other one that came out at the same time was Barbie. And I was hugely confused <laughs> as to why people thought that was a good movie or, or as great a movie as, as we thought it was. But I think it, it probably had to do with the cultural aspects, uh, which I didn't get to participate in, in as a child because I was not here and I didn't, I don't have a emotional connection to, uh, Ken or Barbie as a kid, for example, and, you know, a lot of boys, I guess, didn't necessarily, but they would have known their sisters or their, you know, cousins. Uh, being interested in Barbie or whatever, and then that would have influenced them culturally differently. But um, yeah, so I guess Oppenheimer, going back to that, I think it was a, it was a great movie and it's a heavy, big subject. There's some people making parallels between AI and, and nuclear weapons. I don't know if you've heard that. No, please right, go on. Recently. Yeah, so... <laughs> So people basically it, it, nuclear weapons were or and nuclear energy w was this extremely powerful technology that was developed uh you know in the 19 or 20th century and uh and so they were like you know supposedly there were the, all these um guardrails or or it, it, government was doing everything because there was no private company in a position to really build those or maybe there could have been but because the war was going on uh private companies, the equivalents of NVIDIA's and, and Google's and Microsoft's and whatever. The, there was no, no company like that in atomic weapons, right? Who could have built the bomb at the time and, and maybe given enough time they could have, but they just weren't. And, uh, and so the government was in the thick of things. Um, whereas, and, and these are extremely powerful weapons, right? And, and tools that were being built. So now a lot of people are saying AI is extremely powerful and it's going to be very potent, etc. And so how how do we ensure as humanity, as society, that we have guardrails, right? And uh, and right now, actually, I think the compute, which is the biggest fuel, if you will, required for AI that exists in the hands of the private companies is much much bigger than anything the government has. Any government, maybe except the Chinese government uh, has access to, right? Um, and so, so we're in this kind of a version 2.0, <laughs> if you will, with a lot less oversight of these extremely powerful platforms and tools that are being created by humans. Uh, there's a lot less oversight by the governments. They, I think, you know, there's this, at least in the States and probably around the world, we have a dichotomy in society between, um, uh, you know, government control versus private enterprise or market forces, et cetera. Right. And, and, and so I think it, sometimes it, we take it too simplistically. There are a lot of people who are like, oh, government's all bad. And there are a lot of people like we need government to control or regulate everything. And, and, Maybe the answer is a little bit more nuanced. Um, but I think one thing is generally true. Whenever things are happening in private businesses, there's way less transparency, right? Because private companies are, you know, they, they, they have privacy. And governments, even sometimes it takes time to find out what the heck really happened or how decisions were made in, inside of government. But they're... Over time, at least you have transparency, um, and then usually you try to have real, real-time transparency, at least in democracies and so on. So, 
I think with artificial intelligence, uh, we'll see kind of how things evolve. But uh, I personally am not scared of artificial artificial intelligence, right? In 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 a sense that I I doubt it's going to have a conscious or a or it's going to be sentient and have goals of its own and what what not, right? The scary thing will be, and this is has existed forever in humanity, which is you'll have good actors, good human actors and bad human actors, right? And so the more powerful tools and weapons that exist, then bad actors will occasionally have access to those and maybe frequently have access to those. And so then the part of society that is trying to protect the rest of us, um, you know, it'll have to be agile, nimble, creative, energetic, etc., to keep up with the the people who want to create harm for other people. And so, and this was indeed the case, right, with the atomic weapons, right, which was like, hey, this thing's so powerful in order to not have it be in the hands of the bad actors, you know, let's do non-proliferation or, or even there were people focused on eliminating nuclear weapons, right, soon after, including Oppenheimer, uh, soon after it was created, right, and, um, one of the, the things, by the way, going back to that movie question, Oppenheimer question was attributing moral responsibility, right? Who should morally feel responsible for building these weapons that can destroy, you know, lives of hundreds of millions of people or at least tens of millions of people in very short order of time. And I think um, that's, uh, it's not really an individual that, an individual can say, oh, yeah, I pulled the trigger on a bomb or something like that, right? Or I, I, I did something like that. But I don't think any one individual probably bears the moral moral responsibility of nuclear weapons, right? What, whether it was Oppenheimer or, or... One of the things I, I found interesting as I was reflecting on the movie was that I think the, uh, General Groves doesn't get nearly the credit in the popular... Uh, version of the story as Oppenheimer does, right? Uh, and and I don't know if you remember that character. Right? General Groves actually was the military general in charge of the program who had hired Oppenheimer, right? And then he had approved all the major decisions of the Manhattan Project. And so, so he's like, who is more responsible? If you were to say Oppenheimer was responsible uh, for creating this super destructive weapon, um, and then, of course, it goes up to the president and, and all these things. So, um, yeah, those are some some thoughts on AI and nuclear weapons. And in some ways, that people are saying that the ones who are, you know, really scared of AI, it's that AI is going to be much, much harder for societies and for humans to kind of keep in check or, you know, mm -hmm. help pre prevent the bad actors from using it abusively than nuclear weapons were. Because nuclear weapons are, the formula is easy, but they're not easy to make, right? So there are even these nation actors, um, Iran, North Korea, and a bunch of others that want to make them, and they probably have made them. Um, it takes a lot. And so it's kind of hard to not, to, to do that while hiding everything. But with AI, you probably won't have the same kind of, um, challenge in, in, you know, a bad actor hiding their activities until it's too late. Yeah, I mean, this is a world changing event in some similar ways. And you outlined concerns there. And I was listening to your conversation, I think, with Indira, I don't pronounce her, her last name, but she was talking yeah, about Negi. kind of medicine 3.0. Yeah, disease prevention, health tech, bionics, AI. So concerns aside, what are you excited about and what are you what do you think's currently overhyped? Oh um, yeah, so so by the way, this is a good topic. We do do AI work at <laughs> tech advisors, which all you know technology and business consulting companies are facing now is, is, is we do run into AI scenarios or client requirements. Um, and and we've been hosting a series of events um, in person, actually, which is AI's impacts on different domains. So we started with real estate, we did healthcare, we did gaming. Uh, actually, the next event we're going to do in May, on May 15th, um, if anybody's interested, will be uh, AI's impact on communications. 
So as far as, you know, what's exciting, obviously, you know, it's going to do, it's already done and it will continue to do things that are humanly impossible, but that are good for us, right? Going back to teaching education, individualized education, I think AI is going to deliver on that, right? That's been a promise people have been talking about forever, right? And and it's not like all or nothing. It's not like you hit zero today and then it goes to 100% tomorrow. It's been happening, right? Um, and so if you go to healthcare, individualized medicine is going to happen, right? Because of AI and not just because of AI, that's, that's probably more to do with compute and, and as well as the, you know, other biotech technologies or life science technologies becoming uh, better and better and more accessible and uh, lower cost. But there's, there's just a set of things that humans can't do. I think those only AI can do, which are good for us. So, so for example, it, it's been the case for a long time now, but certainly now an, uh, an expert system or AI enabled oncology um, solution can um, diagnose cancer better than human doctors can, right? By looking at various images of, the, you know, body parts or whatever bodies. And so I think those are super exciting, um, exciting developments or possibilities, right? And many of them are already happening. I think AI or technology is so advanced that for most of us, not only will we be surprised by what will be possible in the future, we would be surprised if we really knew what the heck's happening today as to how good technology and how good AI, what we call AI has, has been even for the last year or two or five years, right? Um, I, I happened to work uh, with a company where we were advising a, a startup in the Bay Area that had experts from like Stanford and Oxford and MIT and Berkeley and stuff who were basically, and there are a lot of teams like these, they were, um, you know, AI is compute limited. So anything you can do to improve the algorithms, to get more efficiency out of the compute uh, and, and uh, training data, then you're, you know, you can do more, right? Whenever you have that. So this company was, they were creating a set of algorithms, um, neural network algorithms that would require, you know, orders of magnitude, less compute to get the same level of accuracy, et cetera, as well as orders of magnitude of less training data. And it was interesting as we started looking at different domains as to what it can do, right? So it can pretty much work in any problem domain, right? It's kind of like in, where you need narrower intelligence, where you have humans making decisions based on a set of facts, right? I mean, humans are big input and output engines. We're not, we're not hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, we're not, we're not magicians ourselves. We need inputs. And so anything that has an input, I think, uh, and then you create an output, AI will be able to help you. Uh, in some fields, it'll take a while. Maybe self-driving cars is one of those things. Maybe having a healthcare kiosk where a physician, there's no physician physically. It's just a machine that, that you go see and it says, oh, you know, Harash, you, Based on what I see, you might have this problem. Maybe you should go see a human doctor. Maybe you don't need to. Here, take these three pills and go home. Um, right now, I think that kind of scenario, at least in the U.S. A healthcare setting, is not something possible. A regulatory and other constraints, because of the other constraints, uh, where you just have a non-human healthcare expert taking care of you. But I think those things will happen. Uh, just like self-driving cars, right? People are... I don't know, 10 years ago, people would have said, no, 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 or many people would have said, no, 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 right? And still they're not there, but they're driving in many, many places, right? Um, and it's, it's eventually you'll get to a point where it'll be like, oh, this is certainly better than humans driving, right? So yeah. those kinds of things I think will come up with, with, um, with AI scenarios in healthcare. So healthcare, education, Pretty much every domain, but you know, every domain will be impacted. Whether it's entertainment, uh, communications, and there are so many use cases that could be better, where it, it'll make a huge difference. But going to the other part, which is where is it overhyped? And I'm not sure. I mean, all these companies, right, are marketing heavily. 
right? And then everybody's like, I'm your friend. The other people are not your friend, but I'm your friend. <laughs> and so <laughs> you can take any of the names, uh, big tech, small tech, specialized in, in AI and so on. Uh, I think, so going back to empathy, factor, empathy and, and human existence, kind of super philosophical or, or broad. So in our healthcare event, we did, uh, I think it was in December, and there was a panel and we had some experts from small companies and um, some life science experts and healthcare, health tech experts and so on. And so we talked about AI's impacts on healthcare. And uh, I think myself and a couple other people in the audience had a question which was very basic. If you look at it from a healthcare standpoint, what are the things that are important to me? For me, the things that are most important and, and is quality of life and the length of life, right? If I had to like boil down, what is good health mean, right? <laughs> or, right, it's like, okay, if somebody, if something helps me live a quality life longer, then that's like, that's a good thing, right? And, and if something really doesn't contribute to that, then is it a good thing, right? Or how good is it, right? And so, so I don't have somebody to ask this question to. Maybe somebody in the audience will come back to us or to you with the answer. <laughs> but will AI make me live a longer, longer life of higher quality than I would without it? And that's not just healthcare. Now you're talking about, you know, my entertainment experience and my transportation experience and my house experience and my work experience and my family experience and my health experience, everything. And I think, I think the answer is no, right? Or at least it's not a, as easy a yes as many AI platform companies and teams, including maybe even our own <laughs> might want us to believe. Right. So if that makes sense, um, and, and, you know, one of the biggest problems with AI, for example, right now, even just to implement it is garbage in, garbage out. Right. There's so much training data that's, there's so much data that's being used to train AI that's garbage. So you can't trust AI. The error rate is so high. Um, and so, but even, even once you fix all of that, it's like, will my life be longer? And will my, I think the, the disease experts or the public health experts have a term, which is um, high quality life, basically your high quality lifespan, which is what span as well as I, lifespan. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, so me, for me as a consumer, right. Or as kind of a, a human, <laughs> that's what I'm curious about. Will, will that, um, Will that change? I mean, it's, it's exciting. And, and you've probably gone to 3D, you know, movie screens and stuff like that, right? You've had those and then you put on those glasses and stuff. So what happens is you go there and you pay some number of extra dollars to get that versus the regular screen. But I find that after five minutes, I don't know the difference. Right? I don't know if that's something for you. And so then in a way, eventually after I get out of the movie and then a month or two later, I don't think it's any, any different as to whether I watched the movie in a good two, 2D screen versus a 3D screen and glasses and whatever else people have done or, you know, are doing. So, um, so I mean, I, when I came to the States in the eighties, uh, we used to have these pirated Bollywood, uh, Hindi movie tapes or cassettes, video cassettes, right? Where you couldn't even see, you could barely tell that there was something moving on the screen. I don't know, it would have been copied and copied and copied like 20 times. It was like right? 1D, not even 2D. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. All you had was audio. And so, but people still would watch the whole thing. And these are three hour movies, <laughs> right? And so, it's, it's, I think that it, with AI, we might, we might end up with similar kind of a situation where everybody thinks it's better or it will make things better and better and better. And you'll eventually have a different experience than you would have had without AI of life. 
but then ultimately like would you consider it better if you had to chance to reflect on it um you know uh, after your life was over which i guess we won't get a chance to reflect on but so yeah it kind of brings up this philosophical question of, well what is quality of life because if you take the health stuff out of it for a second ai and whatever technology that comes along you know it can make your life easier and more pleasurable in certain ways but is that that's not a, equated to meaning necessarily right so what is quality of life yeah and that's a very personal question right uh, because uh, identical events two people will perceive as having you know different reward value or satisfaction value so maybe it's what buddha said right maybe it's enlightenment i don't know right <laughs> the more aware you become uh, the more you would feel you have had a high quality life i'm not sure but that's a probably beyond my pay grade uh, you know as far as what constitutes quality in in a quantifiable definition right um i think uh, and then you, maslow had the hierarchy right oh. of, of needs. needs and so on so the more of them are met more you would feel you had a higher quality life and and um but i think as you get beyond like the food water shelter kind of thing it starts getting very subjective um and so and then a lot of that responsibility lies on me too right and this is also one of the one of the kind of dichotomies right so government versus market forces we talked about earlier the and it ties into like government versus individual so ai will is you know as much as ai will help me or want to help me for example i as an individual still have free will and i have responsibility right so it's like i'm i can be a smoker today right and um I know it's every every there's no question that smoking is bad for you but I can be a smoker today and so um so there are a lot of reasons why but it, where, where individual choices may actually prevent life from being or health spans from being longer or um lives from being longer as well so it's, it may not be just a function of AI or external factors to individuals and and maybe maybe in that sense maybe short life spans are higher quality i don't know because if i really enjoy smoking right <laughs> so yeah it's a trade yeah, what is the yeah, price yeah. you're willing to pay for that action exactly exactly so uh, there's a there's a across town there's a institute called the institute for health metrics and evaluation mr gates funded it and it's run through the university of washington and then they they have a concept i think called and maybe other other people in healthcare domain have this concept of the the burden of disease right and so where they're trying to quantify kind of the other way which is what is the cost of disease to quality or length of lives and so on and and so so how do you define the cost of a disease oftentimes people like if i have you know if i'm a cancer survivor people it's like okay i don't wish cancer on anyone but they will say many people who are cancer survivors will say it has made me a better person than i would have been otherwise right mm -hmm. and so in that case was the effect of the disease negative i don't know right and again they would be the first ones to say i don't want anyone to get cancer and then to, in order to get become a better person yeah right. yeah it's a cost to pay i mean i mean going back to your before you even got thinking about all this stuff what was the moment you realized that you wanted to step away from academia and pursue i guess engineering at the time i mean i don't know if you had the thoughts of being an entrepreneur at that point what was that sort of story and realization in your mind 
So um, for me, I, because I, I didn't get the, the doctorate and start on a, you know, in an academic or postdoc or a kind of a research full-time role, it was always as a graduate student. I was a researcher, right? A graduate student researcher. And I was, um, I was in an engineering program at the time um, because I didn't do graduate studies in physics. I only studied electrical engineering and then computer science in graduate school. And so as a 20 something, you know, person, uh, early twenties, the, 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 one of the reasons I left research was I didn't really connect with the culture or, or the people around me. So I really had a very good professor advisor. I really connected with him and I probably didn't appreciate what he did for me as much as I did afterwards. Uh, professor Chi Chan, and uh, he's in Hong Kong now. He's from Hong Kong. And I think he's probably close to retirement. But he was at the University of Washington at the time, and we were in this lab, which literally had no windows. And you're in Seattle, right? Which I guess it doesn't matter if you have windows in Seattle. <laughs> but uh, you can walk away. So. So I was like, you know, I'm, this research culture, uh, you know, it's all published and it's kind of hard to see the, in that particular case, we were doing computational electromagnetics. It's kind of hard to, we didn't have hardware. And so you're, you're, it was hard to see the impact or kind of the applicability. And some of the people and the researchers, some of the students uh, were not very happy when they were, you know, getting close to the their graduate school uh, journey. And then some of them were very happy, but almost nobody was going into academia, et cetera. And so, so I was, and then I also like breadth. So then I, I uh, look for sun and I look for people that were different from researchers to go work with. And so I ended up uh, going to Texas working as a, what they were calling an application engineer, which is basically like a consulting engineer to help clients implement what were engineering products, just in measurement solutions. Um, and so, and then that continued. And then I was working in engineering for several years. Um, and I kind of always knew that I would be an entrepreneur. It took like 10, 15 years after I knew that I would be an entrepreneur. Um, or maybe knew is the strong word, but I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I think there's multiple factors. One of them is that the freedom that you have, right? If you're building something yourself or you're running something yourself, then you have a lot more freedom. And I think um, my particular strengths, which I probably didn't realize, which many of us don't realize what strengths we have. Um, a lot of them were in entrepreneurship and business and client facing type of things that in a research scenario, you don't really, at, at least in the early stages, you don't get to use or or uh, exercise and so um but again going back it was a little bit later when i started working with the clients that actually really opened the door and kind of got me thinking that um entrepreneurship would be a good journey uh, for me because with clients you know it, it, it's a perfect opportunity to be other person centric right you're trying to understand what what constraints they have, what opportunities they have. Um, and consulting actually is even, is even kind of a more extreme version of being other person centric. Because if whenever you have like a fixed product or a solution, you, go, you take it to a client, then the only thing you have to ask is like, hey, do you have a, this kind of a problem and do you want to use this solution, right? What you don't get a chance to ask is what is your problem? Right. Because if it's something different from what your solution can do, you're wasting your time. So you're, you pretty much say, do you have this problem? <laughs> right. And then if, if when marketing and everything is working well, you should be talking to people who have that problem frequently so that some of them be like, yeah, 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 I do have that problem. Then you're like, okay, here's a solution that might help you. Uh, whereas in consulting, you go and you say, okay, you're, you you go and it's, you're open and you say, what, um, what are the considerations and what are the top drivers and incentives for your business? And then see how we might be able to useful or helpful in those. And, and consulting, of course, is a big domain, so you can't 
we don't solve every problem that clients have. Uh, but if it's technology and product related or IT related, we have a pretty broad set of experts and uh, ability to expand our team to curate other experts as well. So, um, and then, and sometimes it's, it's like many entrepreneurs, I should say, don't necessarily come into entrepreneurship with a plan, right? It just kind of happens to them. Um, I mean, when, when they're closer to it, of course, they have to make some conscious decisions, which is like, okay, you know, it's going to be risky. I may not have a paycheck for a while. How's the family thinking or feeling about this? If there's a family and, uh, and so there's a lot of, um, like as you, when you're closer to pulling the trigger, so to speak, then you have to be extremely conscious about what you're doing. But like five, 10 years before you do that, you may or may not be as conscious because you're, it's not something immediate. Um, many, many people do. So there, there are different types of businesses you can um, create if you're thinking about creating businesses, right? So, and we talked about this slightly earlier, which was there's innovation driven enterprises, right? Where you're like, you're going to, boil the ocean, you can do something crazy, you can push the envelope on the edge of a deep expertise that you have, or you're going to just do something crazy, right? Like have strangers ride in strangers cars or have strangers stay with strangers in their homes, uh, Uber, Airbnb kind of things, right? So there are people who dream or think of these things. And that's a certain type of thinking or business or aspiration or inspiration that you have as an entrepreneur. And there are people who, um, they don't care to boil the ocean or they don't necessarily have crazy ideas, but they like agency. They like to have, they want to do things themselves, but it could be a, a pizza shop, which is not a new business per se, right? Or it could be a car shop or it could be a, a convenience store and so on. And so I think, um, yeah, I guess, our journeys can be different or motivations can be different. But for me, um, I think probably the agency was a, was a, was a driver that I wanted to have control or I wanted to pursue things in my own way. And, and oftentimes we did focus on innovation as well in some of the companies that we started, uh, with the help of friends and so on. But, uh, these are some of the considerations that I guess happened in my journey. Um, there's a, there's a cultural bias where I came from in India against being a job holder. <laughs> so you, you, we were farmers. And so farming was seen as a, it was, it was seen juxtaposedly as the best and the worst profession. It was the worst, worst profession, um, because financially you were at the mercy, at least in my region, uh, of the rains and the monsoon and so on. And, and so <laughs> farmers didn't fare really well financially, or most of them didn't. But it was the best profession because you were the, the king or the queen of your own domain. I mean, you, you had your farm and you decided what would be planted. And right, it was like your own realm, literally. And so, so then the next thing after that would be to, to be an entrepreneur. Right. Uh, and then, then the third thing would do, would be to, to be a job holder. Right. And, and I'm not, I'm not prescribing to this belief system, uh, anymore, at least not consciously that this is the hierarchy, but that was something that might've been a factor when I was really young. Right. Uh -huh. Was that as a job holder, it was, um, not really the destiny, uh, <laughs> at least as far as expectations were concerned for, uh, by other people uh, from childhood days. But, but of course, um, there's no absolutely best, uh, you know, path, right? And there's, for the same reason, there's no worst path either. So, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, planting the seeds, uh, you know, on the farmland to plying the seeds of business. That's uh interesting analogy yeah yeah i guess planting seeds is, is, is another topic as well but now now uh this instead of individual plants 
our um, focus is individual relationships. So we're constantly planting the seeds of relationships and growing the relationships that we have. That's so nurturing them. That's actually one of the the key things I think for for a lot of people. But for me, if I somebody was to say what constitutes higher quality of life, I think for me it would have to involve quality and quantity of relationships as a metric, right? It's not just about, you know, net worth financially or just how good health you're in, which those things matter. It's like how many healthy, strong relationships you have and um, how many people might attend your funeral kind of thing. So, so yeah, we're constantly, all of us, whether we see ourselves as farmers or entrepreneurs or job holders or whatever we are, we're constantly uh, planting seeds and we're constantly nurturing you know, the ones that are about to germinate or have germinated uh, or even are, you know, grown into full, full size plants, um, like the relationships you might have with your spouse or your children or your parents and your siblings and so on, right? Your best friends from kindergarten. And so I think that's, a, that's a one thing that I could have probably been more strategic about uh, in my career. And this is something that I've shared with, uh, uh, younger people um which is relationships are expensive they're indispensable but they're very expensive so if you can be conscious about planting the right relationship seeds growing them but then doing them in a way so that you have an opportunity to harvest the fruits or leverage the fruits of those relationships and they, they need not be directly financial Right. For salespeople, it's like, I want leads, right? And I want to build a relationship with those leads and then, then start, you know, ringing the cash register. And that's one way to harvest or to reap benefit from relationships. But there's actually a, probably many more that are even more rewarding and they could be even more re rewarding financially longer term. But uh, who can teach you going back to like humans, humans teaching humans, right? Who can be your, your mentor, your guide or your uh, uh, coach, right? That's important. So which relationships who's, who can teach you about domains or about life, or about profession, about health or whatever that is. So that's hugely valuable. Then who, who makes you feel better emotionally, right? Mm. They may not be giving you practical knowledge per se, but you 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 know your all your body vitals get better after you see that person for whatever reason, right? <laughs> and hopefully we have all of these uh, kinds of people in our lives. So I think relationships are are um, something that you could be a little bit more strategic about when you're younger. Um, oftentimes it happens if you're lucky automatically, and this is one of the reasons uh, you know. A lot of people try very, very hard to go to esteemed institutes for undergraduate, graduate degrees and so on. They're like, oh, I'm going to run into these people. And I'm going to build friendships with all these people that are going to be valuable for me life for, for life. And and you could do that. And sometimes that helps um, by going to those institutes or colleges and what have you. But it can be done by anybody in, in no matter what their scenario is, right? Um, whether they are at a particular place of work or a particular college or a particular uh, research institute. Um, but yeah, so that's a, I think relationships are critical and young people can do better by just being more conscious of how they're spending time, who they're spending their time with. Um, most of us, especially managers, I think learn that they're too slow in getting rid of bad relationships. So after your experience as a manager, you realize that, okay, if something's not working out, it's better to call it quits earlier. Um, but sometimes you only learn that through experience as to what is the right time. Yeah. Uh, and, and it will still be subjective, right? Whether it's a job that's not working out, an employee that's not working out, a supplier that's not working out, a, you know, partner that's not working out, a city that's not working out with it, right? Whether you're in Seattle and it's too rainy or whatever, but so. <laughs>
Yeah. I so mean, yeah, I was kind of, those are, yeah, I was key. Your, your one piece of advice or wisdom. And I just feel like, you know, planting the seeds of those relationships, harvesting the good ones and cutting away the bad is kind of a beautiful metaphor and maybe a good place to wrap up. And I totally agree with that uh, insight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think uh, gaining awareness, you know, personal growth, right? That's kind of like an overarching goal that I keep for myself or, or kind of an objective. And it, it's, it's not only maybe it has, might have practical value, but it's also um, something I enjoy, right? And so relationships, um, you know, are a huge part of, um, for me, right? What adds quality to my life and um, intellectually curiosity and empathy are also big aspects of, you know, how I approach life or what life means for me uh, as an entrepreneur or as a, you know, society or citizen uh, of society and so on. So, but yeah, so there are several, I guess, things in there as far as parting thoughts are concerned. But I think, uh, I think anytime one focuses consciously on relationships, I think they can't go wrong. So that's a good, uh, probably if there was one to do, <laughs> use that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Haresh, where can people, with what you're up to, uh, connect with you? I know you've got your own podcast. Uh, was that Conversations with Haresh? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, if anybody wants to connect with me, uh, Haresh Sangani, uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Uh, look for, if there are multiple of me, then uh, <laughs> look for High Tech Advisors also on LinkedIn and uh, conversations with Haresh is on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, just literally search on conversations with Haresh and um, you know, it should be there. Um, and on LinkedIn, there's all the contact info, et cetera. But I really appreciate this opportunity drew to speak with you. And uh, I'm curious to see, you know, how your uh, journey evolves in, in life in general, but also I understand your, uh, you know, doing this podcast and talking to interesting people. So I'm curious how that evolves and, and how that contributes to your goals and expectations. Absolutely. We're learning a lot from people like you along the way. So really appreciate you joining me today for all your, your wisdom. All right. Thank you, Drew. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Suresh. Take care.